Good morning, New Bethel. Good morning, New Bethel. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to everyone online. If you could give us a like or a comment to let us know you're there, that'd be great. It looks like we've gotten a rainy start to our day. Um, just a couple of announcements. Ginger has an announcement, and um, I've been told that the Seekers will not have Sunday school today. So um, everyone's encouraged, if you didn't come last week to the meeting, if you could come today, and there's one next week, right? If necessary. If necessary, yes. Um, so Ginger, if you could come on up. Good morning. Hope y'all didn't melt coming in that rain. You're so sweet, right? <laughs> That's why I use an umbrella. <laughs> um, our Coltons breakfast is coming up in just a couple of weeks, June 8th. We still have a lot of tickets that we haven't sold. I ask you if you haven't bought a ticket, even if you can't come, buy a couple of tickets and give to your neighbors or whatever. Because <clears throat> this is open to outside people as well. And one thing I don't think we've told you, and that's my fault, you can do carry out. So like if one of your family gets up early but the rest like to sleep late, just send that one off. Fill up all the plates for you. As long as you've got a ticket, you can get a carry out for, for the, however many tickets that you have. Um, also, if you think you might know some people that want to buy tickets, you can check tickets out from me after service today. I'll give you the tickets, you try to sell them. What you sell, you turn the money back in for. What tickets you don't sell, you just turn the tickets back in. So we, this is an easy fundraiser where we don't have to do much work. So we really like a little more participation if we can get it from you. Thanks. Um, we still have the sign up for the kids cooking camp and VBS going on. And then um, as you're celebrating Memorial Day tomorrow and doing all your festivities, let's remember all of those that um, made the ultimate sacrifice to use to pay for um, their lot. They lost their lives uh, for the country. So let's remember them. Now, as we listen to the prelude by Sunny. <laughs> Thank you, Sunny. That was beautiful. All right. Um, we come to a time in the service when we want to remember those of our own fellowship. We'll start with them. Those of our own fellowship who have passed away since our last Memorial Sunday. So um, we remember, and we'll hear a bell rung as the name is read. Um, we remember Joanna Krause. We remember Everett Porter Cottrell. We remember Teresa Johnson. And 
we not lost uh, another friend of our congregation last night, uh, actually yesterday morning, Nancy Hardesty passed away. We invite you at this time, there's a microphone right here, and if you have lost somebody in, in your extended family or somebody, they don't have to be associated with our church, but they're associated with you. If you have lost a friend or a family member in the past year and you would like to read their name or share their name, just come forward and speak their name into the microphone. We'll ring a bell and remember them as well. Do we have others? Just come forward. Sam Aikman. Dennis P If you're worshiping with us online and you'd like to uh, type the name of a loved one that you have lost, just do that and uh, we will pray for them as well. Anybody else? Let us also remember um, our service people who have died uh, in the last year. The Fallen. The remembered, the honored, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, soldiers, heroes. Today, we remember the profound sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. We remember the courageous men and women who have given their lives in service to our nation. Their legacy lives on in the hearts and minds of those they left behind. And their sacrifice will never and can never be forgotten. honor their memory not only with words of gratitude, but also with a solemn commitment to uphold the values for which they so bravely fought and died. We ask God to grant us peace as we mourn those who gave everything for our freedom. May we always hold their memory dear and never forget the price they paid. So let us honor the fallen today as we remember our fathers and our mothers, our sons and our daughters, our sisters and our brothers, our heroes. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time of remembrance. We thank you for all those who have loved us and bestowed upon us the gift of wisdom and friendship and, and so many that we don't even know, will never know, have sacrificed for the freedoms that we enjoy today in this country. Help us not to take those sacrifices lightly, Lord. Um, help us to give thanks and praise and honor to not only the soldiers, but to their families as well. Lord, we thank you for the love that permeates this nation. We thank you for the love, your love, that permeates our world. There are times, Lord, when we think that love has disappeared, but it has not. You have not abandoned our world as 
racked with sin as it is, your vibrant presence is still very much with us. We give you thanks and praise for that as well as we ask again that you would teach us as individuals, teach us as communities, teach us as nations the tools that make for peace, true peace, your peace. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. If you uh, have your Bibles handy and you turn in those to uh, chapter 6, if you look uh, right above verse 10, you may have uh, like a title, uh, kind of a summary title for that passage. Uh, mine says, The Whole Armor of God. And that's what uh, we want to talk about today. The call to put on some armor was certainly not an unreasonable utterance, considering all that was going on in Ephesus at the time. As Chuck Treadwell puts it in uh, his sermon on this text, he says, at the time this letter was written, the Christian community was on the radar screen of anxious authorities. And Paul had been arrested, beaten, snake bit, shipwrecked, and left for dead so many times, everyone, including Paul, was, surri- was surprised that he was even still alive. End of quote. <laughs> That's true, man. Paul's been through it time and again. And, and here he is in prison, and he's still writing. Yeah, and they're like, oh, he's still alive? That's, that's great. Thanks, Paul. But you add to that the, the fragile unity of a multicultural congregation, and the general anxiety and uncertainty about the future must have been quite palpable in that congregation. So Paul's call to arms at the end of Ephesians is, is completely understandable. Things are heating up. Um, and, and so I, I want to look at this scripture today. We're in Ephesians, as I said, chapter 6. And this is how it starts. I'm going to read verse 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I like that phrase, this present darkness. That just kind of rings, it resonates with me. I don't know, this present darkness. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Whatever you need to go ahead and proclaim the word of Christ, put that on your feet, you know. Um, With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's a good image too. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God, okay? I like that. This is great. It's a compelling call to stand in the Lord's strength. It's a clear identification of the enemy. It's a detailed list of the weapons at our disposal and a call to suit up for battle, right? But as we look closer, we find that these are not the traditional tools of combat but rather a more spiritual version of the body armor. Paul calls them to put on truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God. These are the weapons, he suggests, that will protect, defend, and win the upcoming battle. So I guess one of our questions for us to consider this morning is, are we fully suited up? Are we fully suited up? Paul talks uh, throughout Ephesians about unity. It's, uh, it's one of his main themes, okay? And he talks about the importance of being unified. The church uh, in Ephesus began in AD 53 on Paul's homeward journey toward Jerusalem after one of his missionary journeys. He returned a year later on his third missionary journey, and he stayed there preaching and ministering for three years. So Paul really developed a a relationship with the Christians in Ephesus, and he was very fond of them. At another time, Paul met with the Ephesian elders. He sent Timothy to serve as their leader, 
And just a few years later, Paul was sent as a prisoner to Rome. And in Rome, he was visited by messengers from very various churches, a number of different churches, sent people to visit Paul, minister to Paul, get a good word from Paul, including Tychicus of Ephesus. Tychicus visited him. Well, Paul wrote this letter to the church, or I should say churches, in Ephesus. Okay, there were a number. They met in different places, homes, buildings, whatever. Um, and, and he wrote this letter from prison at this time, and he sent it back with Tychicus. Ephesians is a letter of encouragement, and one of the things that Paul encourages them is to be unified in the power of the Spirit. Um, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So where does the unity and strength of any congregation come from? Where does that come from? I believe that it comes from a shared sense of mission or purpose. It comes from common goals, a healthy measure of humility in all the people, and, of course, the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, I don't think a church can be unified. Ephesians chapter 4 Um, This is a little bit earlier in this letter. Paul says, make every effort to keep yourselves unified, I'm sorry, united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and there is one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Would you read that with me again? There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Unity is important to the health and the witness of any faith community. But unity is not the same thing as uniformity. We are not little carbon copies of each other. We don't have the same experiences. We don't even share all the same understandings of the scripture. We differ greatly. But I believe that our unity is in the spirit of Jesus and our devotion to Jesus Christ. I believe there are things that are essential that we agree on. And I believe that there are other places where we may not agree completely, but it's less important than um, some of the main things like devotion to Christ. That's my opinion. The Holy Spirit, I believe, watches over us. It convicts us. It teaches us. It reminds us and guides us and feeds us and nurtures us. You know, all those things the Holy Spirit does. Think of all that lovely fruit the Spirit gives us, right? Um, In Galatians uh, chapter 5, there's a list. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Um, We just went over this in Disciple Bible Study. Um, Incidentally, today is our final meeting for the Disciple Bible Study. Um, We started back... Did somebody cheer? (laughs) Wait. We, we did start a long time ago. We started back in September. And, and so we've been meeting today, uh, this afternoon's class, our closing class. It closes with a worship service here at 4 o'clock today. And that'll be our 34th week of study together. Everybody go, whew. That's, that's a little more Pastor Penny than you may want, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's more of Jesus. That's the important thing. Um, anyway, but uh, I think that's really neat. Um, But we just went over this in in Disciple Bible Study that the fruit of the Spirit is different from the gifts of the Spirit. Not everyone is gifted to preach. Um, That's one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave me. I did not have that when I was born, okay? Um, In fact, I didn't have that until I said yes (laughs) to, to being a pastor. And then the Lord equipped me and gifted me with that gift of the ability to proclaim the gospel um, from the pulpit. Um... So the gifts of the Spirit are different than the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is for everybody. And, and there's a wonderful list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians um, chapter 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Whose lives? My life? Everybody's lives, okay? The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. As the Holy Spirit nurtures us and teaches us, we develop love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, okay? We all get that fruit. Yay! Every member in every congregation needs all of that fruit to get along with everybody else, but fruit matures at different rates, doesn't it? Um, 
There are many variables that influence the rate of maturity, and so it is with the followers of Jesus. We grow in spiritual maturity at different rates, and sometimes the immaturities of others can annoy us. Oh, was that out loud? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But, but then the patience and the kindness and the self-control kick in and we rein ourselves in and we don't, um, we don't chide harshly, okay? We may gently correct. We certainly encourage. We pray for. And we are long-suffering with others as we live in the unity of the Spirit. It's a very dynamic process. But if the Spirit is in charge, I believe that there is still unity and great strength and there's Christian love. For one another. That's what it means. Um, and I think what Paul's talking about when he begins, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. Now, he then goes on to talk about the enemy. Um, he identifies the real enemy. The real enemy is the devil, not the Romans. In a church that was filled with Jewish people and Gentile people, the enemy is not each other, certainly, okay? The true enemy of every community of faith is Satan. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. You know, we talked about that a little bit last week. We talked about the devil being a schemer. He's a manipulator. He's a liar. He takes advantage of situations. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, suit up, Paul says. Stand up, assume the warrior pose, right? Ladies, yoga, yoga friends, all right. Assume the warrior pose. Put on your belt, your breastplate, your shoes. Grab your shield and your sword and let me hear your battle cry. <laughs> I knew I'd get one from the tech booth. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I like this passage. It, it, it really, if you read it, if you read it right, it, it gets your heart racing and your blood pumping. And, and just listening to Paul's call to arms, I can almost hear the roar of battle and the clanking of steel on steel. But wait a minute. There's not actually any steel in this armor, is there? There's not actually any roar of combat in this armor. As Treadwell points out, if we look a little closer, while it sounds at first like traditional armor, the content is actually quite different. I mean, we have the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the helmet, the shield, the sword. One would assume in their time, leather, wood, and steel. But if you look closer, closer the belt is the belt of truth. The breastplate is righteousness. The shoes are whatever makes you ready to share the gospel of peace. The shield is your faith. The helmet is salvation. And the sword, it's not steel. He says the sword is the spirit. It's the word of God. I, I tried to find an image that I liked to throw up on the screen that wasn't all, you know, gladiatorial, and I couldn't find one. I decided I'm going to have to work at drawing my own. <laughs> I'll, I'll surprise you with that one day. But, um, you know, everything is just so, so military, right? Just, just, you know, the battle, the violence, the bloodshed. The, but that's not what Paul's talking about, is it? The armor of the world... looks like that <laughs> but the armor that Paul's talking about is is very unusual indeed it's very unusual armor in Paul's spirit inspired opinion the traditional tools of combat are not going to be adequate for battling the devil and his schemes the armor of the world with its heavy weight and its penchant for violence is the wrong armor in the spiritual conflict that the congregation of Ephesus was facing Instead, Paul says, you have to put on the spiritual armor of God. You need to put on truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, prayer, and connection to the Spirit. That's the armor you need for the battle at hand. 
I wonder what the Ephesians in that faith community thought of Paul's invitation. I mean, seriously, how many folks in that church thought they were in possession already of these unusual tools for combat? How connected were they to the truth? How righteous were they? How strong was their faith? Did they feel assured of their salvation? How vibrant was their prayer life and their connection to the Spirit? And put all of that together, and what does it even look like? I mean, how does that work? How is that defensive at all? I bet a number of folks hearing Paul's letter would have preferred the worldly armor. I don't know about this spiritual stuff. I I like the protection of a good shield. I I like the feel of a nice heavy sword in my hand. Then I feel like I can do some damage. Then I feel like I can stand up and protect. I wonder if Paul's readers thought this armor of God would be very uh, effective. You know, is this going to work, really? And I say that because I wonder the same thing. (laughs) I mean, in the real world, how effective is that stuff? Don't you wonder that sometimes? When we look at all the conflicts surrounding us in the world and we read Paul's words and they sound really good, but how effective is the armor of God when somebody you thought was a friend is throwing you under the bus at work and getting you fired? I mean, how effective is, is wearing that armor when somebody's out to get you? How effective is the armor of God against a physical attack of violence? That happens all the time in our area, in our, the place we live. How does the armor of God stand up against a tornado blowing across the field coming right at your home? How does the spiritual protect from the material at all? In the midst of all real-world conflicts, we have global and national and racial and denominational and interpersonal conflicts. What does the armor of God do for us, really? Treadwell notes that uh, when we're dealing with such conflicts, we frequently make two mistakes. First, we assume the conflict is only horizontal. We do that sometimes, don't we? It's just, it's, it's me against this person, or it's us against them, or it's this nation against this nation. It's just a, it's just a horizontal thing, and, and God's not with us, right? We forget that, as Sarah Young has put it in her book, uh, um, Jesus Calling, She says, quote, God has not abandoned our sin-wracked world. God is still richly present in it. I like that. Can I get an amen? God has not abandoned us. We forget that at times. God is still with us. So our first mistake is in um, assuming that the conflict is only horizontal and that God's not involved. And number two, the second mistake we make at times is to take off our spiritual armor and put back on the worldly armor because it feels more what secure (laughs) protective tangible right and we get scared and we throw that back on we like the feel of that shield and that sword maybe a little too much and we can do a lot of damage to others that way in the heat of battle we can lose our mind honestly that mind of Christ that is supposed to be in us Um, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That's the mind that we're supposed to have, right? The the one that we're patterning ourselves after, the one that we want to rule us. That mind of humility and service and unwavering trust in God. Let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. That's the peace of mind that we often lose in the midst of our conflicts. Instead of having the mind of Christ, we are distrustful. We are dismissive. We can be hateful, and we do like to blame and manipulate. But what if, instead of shedding the armor of God, what if we kept the armor on? What if we stayed focused on Christ and let our kindness and forgiveness and love and gentleness and hope and faith wash over our conflicts. What might it change? I think it could work wonders in our interpersonal conflicts. I think it would prevent us from doing harm to one another. I think it could help in congregational conflicts, again, preventing us from harming each other and allowing the Spirit to guide. I I can envision it helping in racial conflicts and national conflicts, but of course, many involved in the broader conflicts will still be wearing their worldly armor, won't they? 
The whole world isn't Christian, is it? So what do we do then? Still, I think if the Christians involved are wearing the armor of God, maybe we could have better outcomes. Global issues? Will the armor of God be effective when nation goes to war against nation? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know is that using traditional weapons of conflict has left a trail of suffering and destruction and delivered our, delivered our planet into sickness and fear and despair that spans the globe. That's what I do know. So which armor do we wear? Worldly armor or the armor of God? The question reminds me of a story in uh, 1 Samuel. You, you probably remember this story. It's about David while he's still the shepherd boy. And he comes to visit his brothers at the front line while uh, the army of Saul is on one side and the army of the Philistines are on the other side of the valley. And the Philistines have chosen their champion. You remember his name? Goliath, okay? And so he comes out daily and he taunts the army of Israel looking for Saul to send the champion out so they can have kind of a representative battle. Instead of killing everybody, just let the champions go at it and the losing army will serve the winning army, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but Saul can't find a champion. And here comes this little shepherd boy and he says, oh, I'll fight him. Listen to his words. He is insulting the Lord our God. Let me at him. And, and so Saul says, all right, well, come on in my tent and let me... Let me, let me suit you up, right? And he puts his own body of armor. Saul was a big guy. If you remember from the description, he's head and, head and shoulders taller than most of the other Israelites. And this is a little shepherd boy, okay? So how, how well do you think that armor fit? It did not. And, and so David, you know, David's in this armor, and it's too heavy, and he can barely move. And he's like, Saul, I can't wear this. If I wear this, this armor is going to get me killed. It's not going to protect me. So he sheds that armor. It was the wrong armor anyway. And he goes out into the field and he meets Goliath. And he bends down and he picks up five smooth stones. And that's all he needed to defeat Goliath. That and his faith. Paul hadn't even written this yet. And David was wearing the armor of God. And that was a very real, tangible, material battle. I like that story. Today's lesson invites us to consider if we are fully and properly dressed for the battles that we encounter. Are we wearing the right armor? The tools that the New Testament invites believers to use are strange indeed. Some spiritual armor, some fruit of the spirit, a little bite of bread and a sip of juice that for us somehow is the body and blood of Christ. These things are strange indeed but it is what God has gifted us with. Maybe we have all been a little underdressed. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's a pretty good shield, friends. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to rest upon each of us. Fill us up, Lord. Correct us where we need correcting. Encourage us where we need encouraging. Forgive us where we need forgiveness. Heal us where we need healing. And keep us, keep us loving you, Lord, and loving others. Love of God, love of neighbor.
That's a good life. Amen. We all get to heaven. Please stand if you are able. moment. Um, uh, I've invited uh, Lucas and Sonny to uh, share some news with you. Hey everybody. Um, Sonny and I have been looking for work visa options. Um, as her current visa is running out in the US. And so we did have several options on our table. And while we were praying for that, um, we felt like God was telling Sonny to stop and take a break. Um, and so it is with a sad heart that uh, Sonny and I will be uh, leaving you Bethel at the end of June. Um, we don't know where we're going yet, but I know that God will lead us. And, Amen. uh, yeah, we just, uh, wanted to give this news to you sometime in advance so we can say goodbye to the people that we have served for three years. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll have to plan a little party for him or something. That last Sunday in June, that'll be a busy Sunday, I think. But uh, thank you, guys. I know that they've, they've reached that decision with, with great prayer, and um, I think you both felt very supported by the church. Yeah. You know that you're loved. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Um, you, you can stand now for the benediction, <laughs> and then you can talk to Sonny and Lucas and tell them you love them. Uh, let's read our benediction together. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord 
rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. One more announcement. Um, we have created a new Sunday school class yes. for anybody, uh, our young people in grades 4th through 8th. Yeah, 4th through 8th. And this is our Sunday school teacher, Kathy Johnson. Woo! All right. She's going to be downstairs in room, uh, is 102. it 102? 102. 102. All right. So thank you. Peace. If you'd like to stay and discuss some of the changes that General Conference uh, has made, you're welcome to meet me back in here about 10.15, and we'll have a conversation. Thank you.